We're so honored that you joined us for this week's message here at Hope Church in Kalispell, Montana. Our hope is that you will be encouraged and challenged in your relationship with Jesus. Be blessed as you listen to this week's message. Aren't you glad that we have a hope in the dark? His name is Jesus, and there is hope no matter how it feels, no matter what situation that we're in. And that's what we've been talking about in this series is the truth is that we all go through seasons of darkness, different capacities, and um, there's a light. There's a hope in the middle of that. So that's our hope for this series is to encourage you to, uh, to have hope, to, to, to renew that hope, and to look to Jesus again. So what we're doing, actually, next week we're going to be wrapping up the series with a big family Christmas celebration. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be uh, maybe a little different than what you're used to. Um, it's going to be a multimedia media experience. Kids are involved, and it's going to be an amazing Sunday that you don't want to miss. It's also the perfect opportunity to invite that family member, that work friend or you know that person you've been praying for people are just open to go to church at this time of the year so what we've done is you've got a postcard near you and it's an invitation for you to come but it's also something you should grab you can grab some extra ones at connect center as well and pick pick a few up and invite some people they're going to come and, and so you've got information for our Christmas celebration next week. And then we've also got on the other side the Christmas Eve celebration, which is going to be a more traditional candlelight experience. Uh, but they're both opportunities that you don't want to miss, great opportunities to invite someone. So um, are you guys ready to jump into this series, jump into this word? Man, I love the Word of God. I love preaching. It is a privilege to get to preach today um, at this house. Pastor Lance and MT are not here because they are in Eureka today. They are announcing or have already announced a new campus pastor there. Um, so God brought us just the right person. So we are excited about that. So uh, they are a part of that, so we're, we're, we're so excited that they get to be a part of that today. But uh, he did text me this morning and said, man, I miss it so much. I wish I could be there with you guys today. Um, that's, I, I just believe today is going to be a special day, and God's going to minister to you in a unique way. So uh, let's pray. Let's just invite the Spirit of God to have his way in us. Jesus, we are so grateful. So grateful for your words. So grateful for what you've done to this point this morning. And we know that you really, everything that's happened to this point, You've been setting the stage for what you want to speak. So we say yes to you. We say yes to whatever you want to speak to us. Our hearts are open. And we ask, we request that the seed of the word of God would be planted in our hearts. Let it bear much fruit. Even today, Lord, let that fruit begin today. Lord, I pray that we walk away today more like Jesus, more fearless, more unafraid to follow you into the unknown. So, Lord, we give you this time. We surrender this moment to you. It's all yours for your glory. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. So, um, we moved here in March, as many of you know. So, we haven't been here for a whole year yet. But I got to uh, kind of have one of my one of my requests, one of my Montana bucket list things happen already. I got to shoot a deer here in Montana. I'm really like taking up the, yeah, that's right. Actually, I took the deer from farm to table, or oh, from woods to table. So I, uh, we, we made sausage, we made ground meat, we did it all. And, um, you know, so I don't know how long that will last, but it's exciting right now. Uh, but, I, but I'm into the hunting thing. But let me tell you my hunting story. So we, um, I got invited, I'd gone out a few times, and I didn't really have much luck. So Brent, counselor, contacts me one day, and he says, um, do you want to shoot a deer? Are you tired of playing in the woods? you want to come actually shoot something? So I was like, yeah, sure. So he, um, he invited me to go out day after Thanksgiving, and we went out, and he's like, um, I'll pick you up at 6 a.m. I'm like, p.m., excuse me, what did you say? A.m. So I was like, you know, it's dark, right? He's like, yeah, you got to get started, man. We're going to do it. So, um, so we go out in the dark, and we start just trekking. Like, this is how new I am at hunting. I didn't even bring a light. Like, I didn't even have a flashlight. So he's like, I've got a light for you, newbie. So you take this light. I'll, I'll have the hunting light, like the real one. So I'm stumbling behind him in the dark. We're trying to find our way. And one of the things that we did before we left is we marked out our path. There's an app that we both have on our phone um, that we marked out a path where we wanted to go, a spot we wanted to check out. So we are, at, it's so dark, you can't see anything. So we're just walking through the woods. And as we're walking through the woods, we would check periodically the app. And it was like, well, it doesn't look like that ahead of me. It just 
just all looks the same, snow and trees. So we're just going to go a little bit more in this direction, and eventually we'll get there. And it worked. We got to our spot. But it was so funny. You know, one of the things that happened is we're walking, and, and he stops, and he whispers. You know, hunters like to whisper. You know, he's like, he's like, oh, stop. I hear something. And I'm like, oh, you hear something. I'm like, man, this day is like starting off great. He's like, I hear drinking. I'm like, drinking? He's like, yeah, I hear drinking. So I stop and I listen and I hear it. I hear drinking. And I'm like, man, this deer is drinking a lot of water. It's just kept drinking and drinking. And I'm like, man, that's a big deer. It's got to be a big one. I was getting all excited. So we keep on walking, you know, to the spot where, we, where we're headed. We get over there. The sun starts coming up. We can't hunt there. We can't see it. We, we, we couldn't tell until the light came up that we couldn't even hunt there. It's somebody's land. So we're like, we couldn't hunt there. So we turn around, we come back, and we see these deer on a ridge. I end up getting the deer, and it was like, you know, it was awesome. I was like, I got the deer. But we're on the way back, and now with the sunlight up, we walk by the spot where the deer was drinking water, and we hear it again. And I'm like, man, that deer is so thirsty. <laughs> It was just like still drinking water and just kept drinking and drinking and we look with the help of the sunlight and we saw a stream going into the lake nearby and we're like oh it was a stream not a deer drinking and it can be so confusing in the dark the truth is there are so many things that can be so confusing in the dark and life doesn't give you an app to lay out exactly where you're going to go and direction on here's how you get here your life and my life is full of moments of darkness that are, as we talk about darkness today, the context for the way I want to talk about darkness is with confusion. I want to talk about those seasons in our life when we face confusion, when you don't know what is happening, what's coming up next. Why am I in the middle of this situation? We all experience situations like that. I've had a lot of situations like that, and I'm still learning what to do in those seasons of confusion. So we're gonna look at the story of Joseph and Mary today, as I believe they were faced with something very similar, a very confusing season in life change that we are aware of, but we're gonna dig into it a little bit deeper. If you're taking notes today, Today's message is entitled, Pregnant with Hope. Pregnant with Hope. And, and what I want to look at, what I want to talk about is those moments when you long for something, you desire something, you want to see it, you pray into it, you hope for it, but it doesn't look like anything is happening in that moment. It looks like nothing's going on. And that is a very common thing. It happens to all of us. So why don't we look, we're going to look at Scripture, Luke 1, is it the passage we're going to look at when Mary is visited by this angel and changes everything about her life. In verse 26. So her cousin Elizabeth is pregnant as well. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. So Gabriel, the messenger angel, appears to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Now look at Mary's response. Verse 29, Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, for he will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. So what's fascinating about this encounter to me is, you know, I've read this my whole life, right? If you grew up in church, you read this your whole life. Every Christmas, you know the story. But what I've, I've never really noticed this until more recently, that Mary, it says she is confused and disturbed. Two things I want to look at today in the message. But it says that she's confused and disturbed because of what the angel said, not because there was an angel in her room. <laughs> like, isn't that strange? Like, if an angel came into the room and starts talking, it would be written of me, Joshua needed a new pair of shorts. <laughs> you know, something along those lines. But it doesn't say Mary was so scared and about the, the moment, but it says she was confused and disturbed because of what the angel was communicating to her. Now that's interesting to me because it shows that Mary is thinking something does not add up here. 
There's something about what I'm hearing and what I know about myself and the trajectory I think I'm on that does not line up. I think Mary was confused, and I don't want to offend anybody today, but I think this is true, and we'll just look at it. I think Mary is confused because she is a normal person, just like you and I. She's not deity. She's not perfect. But she hears this call of God to carry the Son of God to a lost world. And she's probably thinking, why me? Why would it be me? Now, I'm not discounting Mary's holiness and Joseph's holiness. I'm sure they were. I'm sure that they strived. But the Bible tells me that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means that Jesus didn't just come through Mary, but he came for Mary. So to me, when I hear that and I read it, I'm, I'm encouraged. That gives me hope because I'm thinking God chose to use flawed people just like me and I think that's what Mary's probably thinking me why me if you're taking notes I want you to write this first one down I think this is so this is encouraging to me everyone has a shadow when the light appears everyone has a shadow when the light appears nobody but Jesus is shadowless so, you know, you think about this, and it's like, sometimes we elevate people, and I think, you know, when I was in the South, if I would talk about this at all around Christmas, I had to be really careful because we had so many people um, who were Catholic, and my heart was never to offend anyone, and, and I, as you dig into this and you listen, it's like, you know what, that actually is encouraging to me. That's life-giving to me, to know that God would choose to use Mary, and he wants to use me as well. God uses imperfect things to bring his message and to bring his purpose to the earth. That's an encouraging thing. And what, what I love about this story so much is that when I look at Mary's life, she feels the same way I feel. <laughs> like, are you sure, God, you want to use me? Because I know some stuff about me. I know me. Are you sure you want to do this? And what I think we, we get, one of the dangers we get into is we elevate people, we put people on this pedestal, and when they fall, we don't know what to do with it. You see this every year, multiple Ministers will end up falling from ministry and some kind of capacity. And the saddest part to me is not so much that that happened, but it's that all these people are blown away that put them on a pedestal. I can't believe it. I'm walking away from the church. I'm not going to serve the Lord anymore. This whole thing was a lie. If the person I put up on this pedestal could fall, then I have no chance, or it was all a lie, and God's not real, and whatever. We, all these things, people fall because we put people on these pedestals. But to me, when I look at this story, I, I am reminded that it's okay to have some flaws. It's okay for me to not be perfect. Jesus is looking for carriers, He's not looking for perfect people who are going to make it all about them in the first place. He's looking for carriers of the gospel. And that's what he found in Joseph and Mary. He found carriers. And it's so much so that it, it confused Mary. Mary's like, I'm not even sure about this. But he loves to make special things out of common things. Last, last year, the show on Disney Plus came out, The Mandalorian. It's a Star Wars, Star Wars spinoff show with Baby Yoda on it. And he has a name now in this season, but I'm not, I'm not going to give it away for you just in case you're not caught up. But uh, Baby Yoda was like all the, the rave, and he was just like this craze. So Disney had not put out any merchandise or anything yet, but people wanted Baby Yoda sugar cookies, okay? I don't know if you heard about this. But last year, people got real Pinteresty and made their own Baby Yoda sugar cookies. And the way they did it is if you take an angel stencil for a sugar cookie and you make an angel cookie and then you decapitate it, <laughs> you get a Baby Yoda. It's perfect. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, this is indicative of a secular culture taking over the things of God right now. I'm just, it's a cookie. Get over it. It's a cookie. <laughs> But I thought, what a clever invention. Like, um, it's like kind of morbid, I guess. But, you know, still. It's a very common thing that created something that did not even exist. And I just thought, what a cool picture of the fact that God loves to take common things and make them very uncommon. I believe Mary and Joseph were common. They were godly, yes. But they were just like you and I. 
And the reason we know them today and remember them today is because they stepped into this, they, they stepped into the invitation to be a part of, sto- of Jesus' story. They said yes to it. You know, Joseph and Mary were the first adopted parents. Like, we always look at it as like they carry Jesus, but God chose them, adopted them, and, and God wants to do the same with you. And what I love about this is like they are, they are about to go down, we're about to see, they're about to go down a really difficult path. They're about to step into something they were not made for. But God began to put, that, put it in them, and you see the humanity of them in this whole story. And now they have significance, right? Like Mary and Joseph, you're like, yeah, oh, yeah, of course. Everybody knows Mary and Joseph. Everybody knows Nazareth. But none of these places had significance on their own. All these places, they were nobodies and nowhere. I want you to look at a story when Jesus is stepping into his, he's in his ministry in Matthew 13. It says this, that Jesus returns to Nazareth in verse 54 to his hometown where he taught there in the synagogue and everyone was amazed. And they, they said this, where does he get this wisdom and power to do miracles? They scoffed. They're making fun of Jesus. They're not believing in the message. He is just the carpenter's son. He's just, Joseph doesn't even get a name. You know that carpenter? He's just that guy's son. And we know Mary. We know about her. We know his mother, his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas. All his sisters live right here among us. Where did he learn all these things? Which, by the way, those couple of verses reveal that Mary didn't stay a virgin. Just saying. Uh, Verse 57. And they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his own family. You know, what's crazy about this is we see Joseph and Mary and they've got like this great legacy. They're, They're like legendary, right? But they weren't like that. Significance didn't come from within. Significance came from Jesus. Jesus gave them significance and Nazareth Nazareth is a, is a nowhere. You know how like on Google Maps, you can start off on the U.S. and you see United States. And you zoom in a little bit and the states appear with their titles. And you zoom in a little further and you begin to see the names of the bigger cities. And you got to zoom in really far before Montana start popping up. But Montana cities start popping up eventually. And then you get to tiny places, little bitty places, that like, you know, you drive through those towns and it's like population 74. Like you get to those eventually. But you got to really zoom in. Nazareth was like that. Scholars believe Nazareth was no more than 500 to 2,000 people max at the time. It's not a special place. It's not a unique place. It's nowhere until Jesus made it somewhere. Je- Joseph and Mary, in the same way, even though they were important to God, they were nobodies until Jesus made them somebodies. You know, we've got this quest for significance today. Everybody wants to, to influence somebody. We never even had this term now, but it's like people's full-time jobs to tell you how to put makeup on and, and like what to wear and like tourists. Like people are traveling. Like in Glacier, there's like tourists that you'll see every year and there's like YouTube stickers on their vehicles because they get paid to make videos about traveling. I want to slash their tires every time I s- <laughs> Did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. <laughs> we've got, we've got, and actually, I really, I wish I was them. But, um, you know, you've got a nation of people that we want significance. We want to be somebody. We want to influence. We want to, so we're looking for all these ways and all these tools that the world gives us. Here's how you do it. Here's how you be somebody. Significance comes from Jesus, from stepping into his story from stepping into what he is doing here on the earth. I love how Tim Keller says this in his book, Hidden Christmas. He says, over and over again, God says, I will choose Nazareth, not Jerusalem. I will choose the girl nobody wants. I will choose the boy everyone has forgotten. What a cool picture. It reminds me that I don't have to be somebody for God to use me. I just need to be available. And when I'm available, he's going to do something with it. Now, here's, here's one of the things. Here's the second point. If you're, taking, if you're taking notes, here's something that, I don't know if it's super encouraging, but it's the truth. The darkness you came out of doesn't dim the light 
you're invited into. So the darkness you might have come out of, when you look back and you see all that, it doesn't dim the possibility of the light you're going to. And some of us put limitations on what God could do in us or through us because of what we've done. And he's like, I didn't say that. Who said that you couldn't do this? Who lied to you? Who made you believe that you couldn't do this? I choose sinners all the time. I'm, he's going to write most of the New Testament. We're just going to get everybody. Whoever's available, I'm just going to put them to work. And I'm encouraged by this, that the darkness I came out of and the darkness I've faced to this point, it does not limit where I'm going and the light I'm stepping into. But I, I think you see this in Mary's story as well. It says Mary was disturbed. So she's confused and she's disturbed. And I think the reason she was disturbed is because all of a sudden the reality of what the angel is saying hits her. She's like, what? This is crazy. Why me? And then, you know, after a while you're like, oh, thank you, you know, so you chose me. But then it's like, what is this going to mean for me? This is going to change everything. <laughs> if I can say it so bluntly, God like ruined Joseph and Mary's lives. Like they had these plans He's going to like, they're going to like build stuff together. You know, they're going to build a family. They're watching Fixer Upper. They're going to shiplap everything. <laughs> this wall's coming down. That wall's coming. You know, they got plans. And Jesus steps in to their life and everything changes. And I think the reality of what this means hits Mary. She's like, I'm going to have a baby and I'm not going to give myself to my husband yet. I'm not going to be married what are, people are going to talk. People are going to not just talk. My life is going to be in danger. John 8, a woman gets caught in the act of adultery. She gets drug out into the street. And the Jewish law, the religious law, is that she needs to be stoned to death. Mary would have been that woman. Mary is looking at her future. I'm not married, but I'm going to be pregnant. Joseph is looking at this. He's like, I didn't, I didn't do it. <laughs> so he's, he's, he's weighing all this too. They're stepping into some serious mess. To say yes to Jesus, their reputation is on the line. To say yes to being a part of Jesus' story, everything changes. In the summer, I went up to Mount Aeneas. Love this hike. But it's one of the hikes in the area that have what, I don't even know what a switchback was, but it's got some switchbacks. So what's interesting about the Mount Aeneas hike is you're on this hike and you're going up a couple of miles and all of a sudden you see the peak and you're like, ah, oh, it's there. I see it, I'm going there. I don't know how I'm gonna get there. It's real high, where's that helicopter? But it's there. All of a sudden you're hiking and you're going in that direction and you get to switchback number one and you're like, how? Oh. It's over there. Why am I going that way? So you finally get to the next switchback. You start turning around. You're like, oh, thank God. You go for a ways. You're like, I'm getting up there. It's still up there. And I don't know how I'm going to climb this elevation. But then, oh, switchback. And it's over there. And it's so frustrating because, like, to me, I want to just, like, run up it, right? But I don't have the endurance for it. Switchbacks are there to help you. They're to pace you, not let, you know, so you don't die on the way up. But switchbacks happen in life too. And it can be so annoying. The angel Gabriel came and he spoke to me about, about my future and I see it. And like Pastor Lance said last week, I wrote it in my diary and everything. I bought a leather bound diary and I wrote it down. I was so excited. Switchback number one. And you start going this way. But God, you, t you said it. Why am I doing this? Devil in the switchbacks. The devil put those switchbacks there. <laughs> God places switchbacks in our story for a reason. And Joseph and Mary are in this situation when they have this promise, and Mary's looking ahead, and she's like, I could already see the switchbacks because my mama ain't going to take this well. <laughs> All kind of stuff's going to go wrong between here and there. And you got to be able to see, you know what? 
I'm stepping into a season of darkness and confusion. I don't get it, but I trust that even though I don't know how I'm going to get there, I'm going to get there. And this story is being unfolded before me as well as I walk it, but I'm not, I'm not going to let the unknown stop me from taking some steps. Following God often means you'll be misunderstood. And, you know, the baby often comes after the pregnancy, right? Pretty, pretty regularly. So, but, but we don't want it that way. We want like instant, oh yeah, this is, but it takes some suffering to get there. And Joseph is weighing it as well. Joseph's a man of God. It says this in Matthew 1, Joseph is weighing all these, this stuff after Mary comes and tells him the story. Joseph's like, yeah, right. Where's the cheaters cameras? Y'all remember that show in the 90s, cheaters? They would try to catch somebody. Joseph's like, are you serious? What's going on here? And he's, and he's trying to be a godly man. His heart's probably broken. He's thinking, there's no way. This doesn't happen. God had spoken for 400 years. I mean, what's going on? There's not, there, why would he do something now? Verse 19, Joseph, her fiance, was a good man, did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you were to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And what's fascinating about this is that, you, do you, I never realized this until I was looking into this, none, Joseph doesn't have a word recorded in Scripture. There's no quotes from Joseph in Scripture. The only thing you see is a record of his actions. So no one could say of Joseph he was all talk. You see the fact that he stepped into the story. He made difficult decisions. He had a choice to walk away or not. And what blows my mind is that the angel comes to Joseph and doesn't try to like comfort him with like, hey, it's not gonna be that bad. Like, don't worry. Like, people are gonna still be your friends. Nobody's gonna believe the rumors. Like, you know, like it's cool. Like everything's gonna be totally fine. Um, no, the angel's like, don't be afraid. All that stuff you're afraid of is gonna happen, but don't be afraid because it's worth it because it really is Jesus. It really is the son of God. That's the comfort he gives him. He's like, all the stuff you're afraid of, don't be afraid because, because I'm God. I'm with you. And, and you see, like, Joseph had to, like, at some point, he's like, he's weighing his options. Like, who do I want to be? Do I want to be the father of the Son of God and risk all of this, risk my reputation and my business and, you know, and, and all the thing, all my plans? Do I want to risk all of that and step into the unknown or do I want to play it safe? And Scripture tells us Joseph did not play it safe. He stepped into the scariest thing in his life. It's crazy how like the people who are the closest to Jesus often suffer the most. His parents had to step into a season of confusion and darkness. Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And I don't know why God chooses to do it that way. I do know that it creates in me a character that understands when I'm crucified with Christ that what suffering is and what selfless love is. Man, I wish it wasn't like that. I wish you didn't have to endure the darkness and the confusion and all of that, but it's part of the story for a reason. The switchbacks are there for a reason. We want the light. We want the glory. We want the story, but we don't want getting there, right? I saw this, this guy who didn't want, he wants the Christmas lights, but he didn't want the work. It was like, close enough. <laughs> so we see people that have these great stories in this light, and you're like, I want that. And then you hear how they got there, and you're like, nah. Because it takes a self-sacrifice, a laying down of yourself to get there. You can't get there without some switchbacks, without some change, without some... I love how David... David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And it says that he's so excited, he's dancing as they're walking down the streets, and he's dancing in his ephod or his underwear. 
And Micah, his wife, looks, Michael, his wife, looks, and she's like, you should be ashamed of yourself. All the young servant girls are all gonna be making fun of you. Where's your dignity? You're the king. And David says in the New King James, I will become even more undignified than this for the name of my God. Boy, what I love about that picture is that Jerry, Jerry and Moses, um, Joseph and Mary, they, uh, they leaned into this too. We're, I'm gonna lay my legacy and my plan and my name and my reputation, I'm gonna lay it all down to step into something way bigger than myself. Much bigger than myself. And, and here's where... I love this. The prophecy of the angel even takes the weight of it off of us. Verse 21, it says about Jesus that he will save his people from their sins. Oh, guess what? You're not the savior. You don't have to carry that. You just have to be the carrier. You just have to bring the light with you. So here's the next thing. If you're taking notes, God isn't asking you to save the world. He's just asking you to take Jesus with you. He's not asking you to save it. Just take Jesus with you. Luke 2, verse 5. Joseph made the right decision. It says he took with him Mary, his fiancee, who was now obviously pregnant. Verse 6, while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him in snugly strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Now, this is funny to me because it says she's obviously pregnant. Like, it's great whenever the Bible gives extra details. If you've ever wondered, like, when it's okay to ask, are you pregnant? I brought a helpful diagram for you today. <laughs> it's also, for bonus, point, just as a bonus man, if your wife is pregnant, it's not okay to say, I know how you feel. It's just not the same thing. So, but Mary, it says that she's obviously pregnant. Why does it say that? I think it's, a, it's an interesting descriptor because as they're on their way to the promise in Bethlehem, when, as everyone is watching and people that know their story, her reputation could not have been more trashed and trampled in the ground. She is obviously a sinner, could be said. And on the way to the promise in the last few moments, it gets worse and worse. Before the light breaks, the darkness got worse. And to, to, the, to everyone else who didn't understand or believe their story, she's walking in obvious sin. Joseph is accompanying her in obvious sin. This is what the world would have thought. They're on their way there, and you would think, you know, you're like, man, we're almost there. Finally, we're going to we're gonna get to Bethlehem, which, all, which is also a place of no consequence, no importance, a small place. And they finally get there. There's no space. So Mary and Joseph, I mean, can you just put yourself in that spot in the season of darkness and confusion that you might be in that you're like, man, I'm close. We're almost there. I can sense something's going on. Why is it getting worse? Why is there no room for us? Why are we stuck in a manger in this cave with animal dung everywhere? Why, are, why is this happening? This is not what I thought. I thought things would look different by now. Have you ever wondered that? I just turned 40 last weekend. I look good, huh? I know. I get that a lot. I'll be honest with you. Like, the couple weeks leading up to that, I was not digging it. I was like, I don't want to be 40. Like, I didn't do this or this yet. I haven't accomplished this yet. I haven't, like, gotten somewhere. Like, you feel like, you know, like, by now I should have done this thing. I woke up the first day of being 40, the day after, and I was like, I'm ready. Let's hit it. Let's hit this decade. But isn't it funny how we go through times where you're like, I thought it would look different. I didn't expect to still be here. I thought I would have made a lot more progress. I thought I'd be more spiritual. I thought I'd have more money. I thought my kids would act better. I thought my wife or husband would love me more. I thought I would have forgiven this person. I thought things would look different because I wrote the promise down and I'm headed towards it. I know it's close, but it seems like it just got worse. Here's what I expected, but here's what I got. And it can be kind of like this. In the 80s, I think it was the 80s, yeah, I was told 
that by the time I got to be 40, I would have a hoverboard by Michael J. Fox in Back to the Future. This is what I thought I'd be doing. I thought this could be like my reality right now, okay? But instead, here's what we really got. This is what they call hoverboards. This is what we got. <laughs> that don't count. That is not the hoverboard I've been looking for all my life. And it's a funny example, but man, it can be heartbreaking to have an expectation and the delivery be so much different, right? It's like, gosh, I thought this was going to be happening. You're the one who started all this, God. You asked me into this. Why is it getting worse? More switchbacks? More of this? They're in the manger. Jesus is born. The promise happens. And I've got to believe that in that moment, everything else melted away. To that point, there was a lot of suffering, a lot of pain, a lot of confusion, but all of a sudden it was here. And it wasn't the end of their suffering. They got to run for their lives to Egypt. They come back, they lose their son, he just runs away. And then their son is on a cross. I mean, it's like, why is there so much pain? I said yes to this story. It's really confusing how much it hurts to say yes to Jesus. And you know, what's funny is like today, I'm about to do like a salvation response thing. And like, <laughs> this is, may not go well because I'm gonna just tell you the truth. You know, I grew up in churches and I would hear all the time, give your life to Jesus. Everything's gonna turn around. Your life's gonna get better tomorrow. I can promise you that. And I'd be like, I want a better life. I'll take Jesus. And man, Jesus says, unless you lay your life down, unless you take up your cross and follow me, you're not even worthy to be called one of my disciples. There is a stepping into darkness that is part of the Christian life. And honestly, I don't even know what to make of it. I don't even know why sometimes. Why are we doing this? And there's a million intangibles that I can say it's worth it. There's a million little moments that I can say, tell you, I, you know, you can like tell you all these stories. Here's a difficult thing. Here's a difficult thing. And like, there's probably more difficulties along the way than like amazing things. But like in you, it did something and you're like, yeah, it was like 10 years of this terrible thing, but I had one good day and it was, it was awesome. It changed everything. But you can't sell somebody on Jesus that way, you know, like, and I'm not trying to sell Jesus to you, but man, there is, you step into some difficulty but there is nothing that matters more in this life than being a part of a story that was written from the dawn of time. The Bible says that while you were in the womb, God had a plan for you, a purpose for your life to step into. But along that path, it's gonna be really difficult sometimes. And we've got some legends in this room right now. Like there are so many people that I've met that you make us feel safe like we trust your relationship with the Lord. And it's like, who do I go to when I have this problem? You've been through some stuff. You've been through some things. And, you know, I just think that there's, when you, when you step back, who do I want to be? What do I want my life to be about? I want to encourage you with this last thing in this last verse. God sees the baby when all we feel is the pregnancy. So sometimes you feel real pregnant and you're like, man, I'm ready to, I'm ready. And God's like, oh, it's not time yet. It's not time yet. And you're like, but I'm ready. I feel it. I feel it. And you know, there's just going to be a time when the pregnancy is, is part of your journey, is part of your story. But be pregnant with hope. Don't be pregnant with despair. Be pregnant with hope. Be pregnant with, with, with trusting that God, God, if you see the baby, I don't see it yet. I don't see the promise, but I trust you see it. So I'm just going to keep saying yes, and I'm just going to keep stepping into the light. I don't know what you're doing, but I trust that you're doing something. In, in Zechariah uh, 4, verse 10, it's a really cool verse. You may know the story about um, Nehemiah comes to Jerusalem when the walls are broken down after the Babylonian exile. They come back to town, the walls are torn down, and Nehemiah's heart breaks. He wants to rebuild the city. One of the men, one of the men that he gets to help him rebuild the city, his name is Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is a forefather of Joseph. 
And I think that you see this lineage of like God's blessing on certain things, and this is really cool. Zerubbabel's starting to rebuild the walls, and you probably look at the walls, and it's like, how in the world is something going to happen with this? Verse 10, do not despise these small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. Plumb line is a, is a construction tool that helps you to find the center of a place by placing it up high, and the weight tells you where the center of that room is or whatever it is you're looking for. So uh, what it says is it says God loves those small beginnings, those humble beginnings, the moments when it looks impossible. When you're looking at the wall that's torn down and there's moss on the bricks and bricks are broken and the enemy has taken a stronghold and you wonder how in the world can something come out of this? How in the world does this even begin? When you're in the manger and you've carried it so long and you're ready to quit and you're like, now I'm here? Don't despise the small beginning. Don't despise the little thing that is about to be birthed. I can't promise you or tell you when it's going to be birthed, but something is being birthed. It's what God does. He plants seeds that grow. And there's something going on in you right now. Some kind of, a, there might be a spirit of darkness that you've been on. There might be a season of darkness that is part of God's plan. But in, that, in the middle of it, be pregnant with hope. We're going to sing a song together, and um, it's called Praise Before My Breakthrough. And I love this song because it reminds me, you know, sometimes you think about praise or worship, and it's like, I praise to declare the, the things God did, the, the good things that God has done. So it's not a time to praise until I got some stuff I can fill in the blanks with. But what I love about this song and this principle and what you see in Mary and Joseph's life as they stepped into Jesus' story is that they decided and God is calling us to praise before you see the baby, before you see the promise. And I'm gonna say some true things about God even if I haven't seen it happen yet. So can we do that for a minute together? Can we stand up and let's just collectively enter into an atmosphere of worship during this time, I just want to challenge you to say what you don't even see yet. Say things about God that you might even not even see it or understand how he's doing it. But I want you to speak some truths about God right now. Thank you for joining us for this week's message from Hope Church. If you enjoyed this message, you can easily support the ministry of Hope Church at hopechurchmt.com slash give. Also follow us on social media at Hope Church MT. Be blessed and have a great week.